Hawkinsville. Steve Pufal here, superintendent of the school district. It's great to have an audience with you this afternoon to talk a bit about the upcoming referendum questions for your consideration. Before I do that, however, I want to take a minute just to say thank you to all of you for the really important work that you're doing to help us keep schools open. And that's really around the safety protocols that are in place in our community and certainly in our schoolhouses. So thank you to you for doing those temperature and symptom checks every morning before you send your children to school. Thank you for being mindful about avoiding physical gatherings. Thank you for wearing a mask. Uh, thank you for staying socially distanced uh, from one another. Those things really are making a difference and helping us to be able to keep in-person learning available uh, for those children that made that, that choice. Speaking of masks, I'm literally in a room being videotaped all by myself right now. The tech team is in a back room separated from me. And so I'm gonna go ahead um, and remove the mask and uh, maybe just improve our opportunity to communicate with one another just slightly. Um, so let's jump in then and talk about why a referendum and why now. Well, two things you need to understand about the state's um, school finance formula are germane to our conversation. Um, first, back in 1993, the state of Wisconsin put revenue limits in place. In other words, the state, since that moment in time, controls or limits how much revenue each district is allowed to spend in its, in its district for educating children. And in 93, there were districts that were sometimes significantly above average spending districts, and they were locked in as above average spending districts. Some districts were spending right around that state average, um, and, and that's where they're locked in for the last 27 years. And, and finally, other districts have been locked in as sometimes significantly below state average spending districts just because that's where they happened to be at that moment in time when this legislation came into effect. Janesville, by the way, is a significantly below average spending district and has been uh, for the last 27 years. The other piece of relevant information is that uh, a really significant part of the state's funding formula that ultimately determines the amount of revenue that we get um, is our membership or the number of students who attend school in the district each year. And while we had very stable um, membership or enrollment for, for really most of the, the years since 1993, for the last five years, we have become a declining enrollment district. And the problem with being a declining enrollment district is that the way the state's, state's funding formula works it's literally impossible without fatally harming your programs and services to cut your way out of that, of that declining enrollment scenario. So let's jump ahead then and, and share a little bit of information around that base revenue limit per member. This chart shows us uh, where Janesville lies in relationship to other school districts, largely around Rock County, right here in our own backyard. And then it also compares us to the state average. As you can see, Janesville is at the very bottom of this list um, in terms of the amount of base revenue that the state's funding formula awards us each year per student. Um, and you can see all the way up at the top of the list is Clinton um, sitting you know, uh, $1,205 per student higher than Janesville is. And of course, probably the two most important numbers are uh, in relationship to us are the state average and then the county average. And you can see I'll focus on that state average. Um, there's a $443 per student gap between the, the, the county average and the Janesville um, amount of allow, allowed revenue. If you, if you multiply that out times the number of members or students who attend our school, that's uh, two and a quarter million dollars per year that we're spending below the state average. Some additional uh, information for you around that base revenue limit. This is a, a busy chart, um, and so I'll, I'll try to dissect this in a couple different ways for you. Um, the first thing I'll point out to you is that the bar graphs going back to 2013 um, show you our average number of members for the last six years. 
And as you can see, for the last four years in particular, um, we have been uh, declining in members. And that is uh, affecting the amount of base revenue that the state's funding formula allows Janesville to have to run its district. If you look at the very bottom line, um, line 7RL is the label, and it's a lime green or a grass green um, line. You'll see back in 2013, the district had $94 million and change in base revenue allowed by the state funding formula. Fast forward to 2019, and we're at $93 million and change, literally a million dollars less six late years later than we were um, based on allowed base uh, revenue limit. And then you can see those lines and charts and, and trend lines um, when you look up at the graph. Um, the reality is, is costs are not going down. Um, the cost of electricity, the cost of transporting our kids on the buses, and, and the cost of labor, most importantly, you know, the staff who come here to serve our children each and every day are, are really um, those, those things that, you, you know, are being impacted adversely by this scenario. So what has the district been doing to get to this moment in time? Um, the district has uh, put many cost savings measures in place. This is by no means an exhaustive list. It just hits some of the high points. Uh, first, we want you to know that the school board in, in their total membership, along with a finance committee, provide very careful um, oversight of the expenditures and the budget um, and the dollars that taxpayers um, give to the district and work uh, in partnership with the administration um, around those issues. Um, we've um, reduced really the cost of health insurance. This is, you know, a very difficult to replicate in most other places. The cost of our health insurance for the district's portion is literally about the same it, it, it was six years ago. And for those of you who know what has been happening with the cost of health insurance, that's um, it's pretty difficult to pull that off. The reality is, is significantly increased costs have been transfer, transferred onto our, our employees um, as a way to manage um, our budget um, in a flat uh, revenue situation. We've reduced, uh, in the three years that I've been here as superintendent, um, 25 full-time positions, um, yielding approximately $3.8 million in reduced staff costs. Um, we've made energy efficient upgrades to targeted facilities. Um, we are prepaying our debt. We, we have interest payments and debt payments from past capital um, purchases. And just like you with your home mortgage, if you pay that debt down early, the amount of interest that you pay is reduced. And so we are doing just that. And finally, we've been really good stewards of safety um, around property, liability, and workman's comp. And, and continue to have decreasing um, rates uh, for those costs. Some people uh, wonder, well, why don't you just cut some more positions? And, you know, why, why do we need these questions right now? You've made some reductions. Why don't you make some more reductions, right? The difficult part of that is um, if we go down 150 kids, let's just say as an example, from last year to this year, well, we have 13 grade levels in this district in 20 different buildings. And so if you spread 150 kids out from four-year-old kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, spread across 20 different buildings, well, what ends up happening is, is you, you, know, you now have 27 kids in a fourth grade classroom instead of 28. You now have 28 kids in a biology lab in a high school instead of 29. You, you just, again, you cannot cut your way out um, without drastically affecting class sizes and programming um, when you're in a declining enrollment situation. Next, to kind of chart out some of those, to put some numbers to some of those cost savings measures that I just described on that last slide. Um, again, going back to seven years ago, um, the total cost of salaries in the district in 13-14 was $65 million and change. Fast forward to 1920, it's up to 72.4 million, which is a 10.8% increase over that time span. 
but when you do an a, an, a per year average, um, that's 1.55% in increased cost of salaries. And when you look at the benefits line, you'll see that the cost of our benefits, and largely that's health insurance, um, is, is almost completely flat, right? 25 million the district spent in 13, 14, 25.3 in 1920. That's a 0.54% increase over a seven year span of time or a, virtually a, a flat cost item to the district. So I think just giving you a sense that the district, um, the board, past and present, um, have worked really hard with the administrative team to try to manage this situation. Um, the fact of the matter is, is Janesville's kind of late to the referendum party in some ways, um, if you will. And um, I, I, you know, three quarters of the districts in the state of Wisconsin already rely on operational money um, to run their districts year in and year out. So let's deep dive a little bit into the two referendum questions themselves. Um, there are two separate questions. Question number one is a capital question. Um, that, that means we're going to um, go out and borrow some money. We're gonna make improvements to our buildings and we're gonna pay that money back just like you do your home mortgage again over the course of a 20 year span of time. And so what would we use that money for? This question specifically asks for 22.5 million dollars. 15.5 million of that 22.5 million dollars is really around uh, the entrances to our school buildings. Our newest school building is Kennedy Elementary School. It's 21 years old. <clears throat> it's uh, like all the rest of our buildings, a pre-Columbine uh, floor plan. And so um, pre-Columbine, all the doors were open to a school all day, every day. We didn't worry about who came and went. We didn't worry about safety. We didn't think about or have to be concerned about somebody coming up with um, ill intent towards our students or our faculty. Fast forward to 2020 and regrettably, that is no longer true. Um, quite, quite the opposite of that uh, is, is in fact the reality that we live with each day. And we need to put in place secure sequence entrances to our schools. And we need to have a minimum universal standard across all buildings in the districts for, district for what it looks like um, to actually gain access to the building and to our students and staff. And that, that access uh, looks something like this, right? You come up to a doorway, there's a camera, a buzzer because the door is locked. Um, you buzz, somebody interacts with you and decides to let you in or not. Step one, that step already exists at all of our schools. Step two, however, and here's where um, the, you know, the, the best practice um, for today's standard and the reality of what we have starts to you know, digress from one another, right? Step two is, is I'm buzzed into a, a secured area. And when I'm in that secured area, there's a school district staff person there to greet me um, to sign me in, interact with me, and make a judgment about whether um, I might belong or not uh, in the school building. If they decide I don't belong, they will take certain actions. If they decide that I do, they will then buzz me through a second set of locked doors that gets me finally into the building where I have access um, to, to the students and staff and the facility. Those second two steps are what is not in place right now in our existing facilities and what desperately needs to be put in place in all schools in the district. Another piece of that, uh, of that money goes for something we're calling life safety systems. Let me give you an example of a life safety system. It's the PA system. That would be an example of a life safety system. In other words, um, when a principal needs to come on in a school and um, issue a tornado warning, or call a fire drill, or heaven forbid, you know, need to go into a hard lockdown because there's an intruder in the building. We need to know that every adult and child in the building will get that message personally in real time and be able to act accordingly. Because in those um, dangerous situations, time 
is of the essence to keep people safe. And unfortunately, many of our building's PA systems are the same age as the buildings themselves. 40, 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80 years old. And those PA systems, while we've, um, you know, bubble gum and duct, work them, duct taped them together, um, they don't work the way they need to, they're not reliable, and they're not repairable, and they need to be replaced. Finally, um, the last piece of the capital referendum is uh, for boilers. Um, boilers, if you kind of think about it, it's like the heartbeat of the school building, right? We, we live in Wisconsin, and, and we have a lot of months where heat is essential for us to be in school, um, and we need to make sure that um, we have reliable heat um, delivered day in and day out to all of our schools. Um, the average life expectancy of a boiler, um, depending on the boiler, is typically 20 to 30 years at most. Um, the boilers that we're looking at replacing, these six would be replacing boilers that range in age from about 30 years old all the way up to 63 years old. And so kudos to our maintenance team for the great work they've done, you know, to keep them running well beyond the life expectancy that, that we could hope for. But the reality is, is just like your furnace at home, um, sooner or later, it does have to get replaced. And so those uh, three uh, items really make up the lion's share of the $22.5 million. Some of you might recall that uh, in 2016, the district did a comprehensive um, study for mechanical engineering um, kinds of things, roofs, windows, plumbing, you know, parking lots, just all kinds of other systems. And you might be wondering, well, don't, I, I kind of remember that, wasn't there like over $100 million of work that needed to be done um, that, that that study talked about? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. This is really phase one of what will have to be a multi-phase approach over time um, to take care of those other issues. The reasons we're focusing specifically on these items right now tie in directly to a community survey that was administered in the middle of the summer this year. And the results from that survey um, came back loud and clear that when we ask people, what, what do you prioritize? You know, there's, there's never enough money to do everything at once. So what are the things that are most important to you? And the feedback from, this, from the community was, number one on the list, safety and security. Number two, attracting and retaining highly qualified staff to work with our children. And number three, maintaining our existing class sizes. Those by far separated themselves from the other, you know, dozen or 15 items on that list. And so we're focused with, a, we really have a laser-like focus around those three items with these two questions. Um, and question number one, specifically, as I just described it, dealt with those safety and security issues. Question number two, um, which I'm going to transition into now, is an operational question, and um, it, it very specifically uh, deals with those second two items on that list, the attracting and retaining highly qualified staff and maintaining existing class size. Um, question number two is uh, asking for the uh, district to consider um, exceeding um, it's revenue limit, that's that base revenue, those graphs that I showed you earlier in the presentation. And the only way by law that we can exceed what the state formula allows is to go to referendum. It's to get permission from the taxpayers um, to exceed that base revenue. And so that's what we're here to ask you to do um, with one of these two questions. We are asking uh, for you to do that on what's called a non-recurring basis. Uh, in other words, the question is written in a way so that that, that revenue that um, we're going to look at some slides here on in just a minute um, will stop, it'll sunset at the end of four years from now. And then the community at that moment in time would in all likelihood have to consider then whether they want to continue to do some kind of operational referendum or not. Frankly, many districts at this moment in time in Wisconsin already have what are called recurring referendums. That means their taxpayers have said, yep, you can exceed the base revenue limit by X amount, and you can do that forever. It never sunsets. Um, we take, we're taking a cautious or conservative approach because this is the first time 
that Janesville's taxpayers have been asked um, to consider an operational referendum. So let's take a look at uh, some, some more information on this, Di diving in a, a layer deeper. So what, what will some of this cost? Well, that first question, that, that capital question um, to fix the entrances to the school, the safety, security, the boilers, um, that, that is projected to cost taxpayers $5 per $100,000 of assessed value um, for the course of a 20-year uh, repayment period. Obviously, different people have homes assessed at different levels, and so if your home happens to be a $200,000 home, I know we're good at math here in Janesville, and you know then that you would pay $10 um, for um, that, that um, question for each of those 20 years. So let's dive into this operational question. What exactly are we asking the taxpayers to allow us to exceed that base revenue limit amount by? So in year number one, which would be the 21-22 school year, we would be asking the taxpayers to give the district authority to exceed the base revenue limit by $3.5 million. In year two, the 22-23 school year, um, we would be exceeding that revenue limit by an additional $4 million for a total of $7.5 million above base revenue. In year three, it would jump up an additional $4 million, bringing the total to 11.5. And finally, in year four, the year after which this would all sunset, we would add an additional $3 million, um, bringing that total um, base revenue limit up by $14.5 million. Now, where did these numbers come from? Um, we've, we've worked closely um, with our partners um, in the private sector uh, to really model out, um, frankly, using some very conservative numbers about what our costs are going to look like in the next four years to basically operate the district in a similar fashion to how we do now. Um, and knowing what we know about declining enrollment and the effect that COVID is having on our budget, along with that declining enrollment and the fact that we are gonna really continue to see, frankly, declines in our base revenue limit moving forward, um, not just staying flat, as I showed you early in the presentation, as it has in recent years. We know that um, this money is essential for us, again, to maintain programs and services, as I think the district has come to expect and appreciate them um, for really a lot of decades now um, here in Janesville. All right, a different way to look at that, same information really, is again, 21, 22, three and a half million dollars. We add that next $4 million chunk in 22, 23, another $4 million of base revenue authority in 23, 24, and finally, uh, another three million in 24, 24 25. And again, uh, a total amount per year in year four of 14.5 above the base. Putting some cost to that, specifically to question number two, the operational question, in year one will cost $34 per $100,000 of assessed value or $34 on a $100,000 house. And all the way out in year four, um, that would increase to $1.14. Um, per $100,000 of assessed value or $114 um, per $100,000 of assessed value. Finally, the last question that, that we get asked often is, so, so what's going to happen, you know, if these questions don't pass? Well, I want to kind of in a way start, uh, end where I started. And that's going back to the survey results. Again, the survey results said safety and security are absolutely priority number one. The capital question, without doubt, is focused exclusively, really, around safety and security. Um, ultimately, the district and, and the taxpayers in this community um, have to make these decisions. And we think that it's really essential in the world that we live in today um, for those measures that I've described throughout the course of this presentation um, to be actionized here as soon as possible.
The second question is the operational question. And um, this question um, is, is maybe a little bit more complicated to explain. Um, and some people have said, wow, is it really a good time right now to especially do an operational um, question? And, um, you know, I'm wondering when will it be a good time to have an operational question on the ballot? I, I, you know, maybe you all have better crystal balls than I do. And if you do, please come and share um, because that, that would be really helpful, not just with this, but a lot of other things that we're trying to do right now um, to serve our kids and keep our promises. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we really, and when I say we, I mean our Board of Education and this administration felt like this is too important of a question for us to not ask the community, for us to not have a referendum question at this moment in time to allow the taxpayers to weigh in and describe what you want the school district of Janesville to look like for the next generation of children who will attend it. At the end of the day, if we were not to come to you with an operational question at this moment in time, it would mean that we would have to proceed with year one of making three and a half million dollars of reductions in our budget. And I'm not gonna stand here and start giving you a specific list of programs or things that will get cut because what I can tell you is that everything on the list of potential reductions will be distasteful. Everything on that list will have an advocacy group that will fight for keeping their, their, their piece of that thing on that list. And for legitimate reasons, for legitimate reasons. At the end of the day, school districts are, are, are about teaching and learning for kids. We're a people organization. 79% of our budget is consumed by salary and benefits. And so being a below average spending district for 27 consecutive years, I can tell you, um, and I've given you some examples here today, there's really not three and a half million dollars of low hanging fruit out there to make reductions that won't feel painful. Those kinds of reductions have, have been actionized. And so, we felt that before we um, moved forward with making those kinds of changes, the kinds of changes that will increase class sizes and will affect the kinds of programs and the amount of access that kids can have to those programs um, that we really needed the taxpayers to weigh in. So let's just talk about some numbers and, and give an example. Let me preface that by saying this is not the plan and it won't be the plan. Um, at the end of the day, all employee groups would be affected um, by reductions in staff from administration to teachers, custodians, food service, support staff across the board, right? And there will be no way for that to not happen if, if this operational question doesn't pass. I will use teachers as just an example. Uh, again, only just that, an example. The average cost for salary and benefits combined for a teacher in the district is $75,000. So if you do the math on that, 10 teaching positions is $750,000. 20 is 1.5 million. 40 positions is 3 million. And you can, you can do the math from there, right? Um, and so um, at the end of the day, to make those kinds of reductions, and again, that's not the plan, it will be a combination of all employee groups, can only adversely affect the class size that we have and that we've enjoyed um, for, for really decades in this district, and also the kinds, the, you know, the scope and breadth of programs that are available to our kids. And we have vast uh, opportunities that are really aligned with the world that we live in today that serve our kids well. And, you know, we just had a great example of that on, uh, on the front page of the Gazette here recently where we had um, our apprenticeship program highlighted and showed an example of how kids um, have career plans and can track directly into um, the trades out of our school district as just one of literally dozens and dozens of options that are available to our kids today. And so we think that it's important for the taxpayers to really make these important decisions. Um, it's too big um, for this board and administration alone 
um, to move forward with those kinds of changes. And so we come to you for your consideration with these two questions. Um, we thank you for taking time to learn a little bit more uh, about um, these questions and the referendum coming up on November 3rd. If, you, if you're interested in additional information, please feel to jump onto the district's webpage. There's a lot of additional information there. Or feel free to call the district office and we'll get you, get you connected to the right person to have a conversation around whatever topic it is related to the referendum that uh, is uh, important for you to know more about. Um, again, thank you for your time. Please vote. Um, we need all of your voices to be heard. Thank you.